I'm here today with uh, Hillary Appelstadt uh, from the American Coral Directors Association and I'm Executive Director, uh, Catherine Dehoney, the President and CEO, is that right, of Coral That's America, right. <laughs> and uh, Amy Moyer, uh, Director of Coral Activities at Woodson High School in Fairfax, Virginia, and also the President of the Virginia Chapter of American Coral Directors Association. Good morning, ladies. It's wonderful to see you all. You, uh, as I was saying, when we all logged on, you were three of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, I have long relationships with all of you and um, I have appreciated your input and guidance in my life and really wanted to just get you all in the same room today to share some perspectives about why men sing and what we can do to encourage more men to sing and what we can do to encourage men to sing in, uh, in courses across the country. So I know Catherine, you have to jet early today because you have another meeting to get to. Yeah, so. Um, so I'm going to start with you. I have deep admiration and respect for Chorus America as an institution and the research that you all provide to the choral community. So uh, what are your thoughts here, Catherine? What, what is it about, um, about singing that, that inspires us and, and wants, makes us want to do it? Right, right. And, and why it's especially valuable, I think, for uh, young men and uh, lifelong learning in general. But, you know, I was thinking about it with the pandemic. I read something that uh, men tend to be more isolated anyway. They tend to have, uh, they, they have to deal with the effects of isolation at a more frequent rate than women. And the pandemic has just made that even worse. And one thing we've learned in our course, America's research about uh, choral singing is that people who sing in choruses, men and women, report um, much less frequent feelings of isolation, the symptoms of depression as, as compared to the general public. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it uh, for children, especially young boys, um, I think all the other wonderful things we know about choral singing uh, from uh, our research. We did research in 2009 about the impact of choral singing on children and youth um, as reported by teachers, any kind of teacher in school, not just music teachers and their parents. And uh, it's undeniable uh, the correlation between singing and academic social, emotional skill and um, growth. So uh, to me that it just underscores how valuable it is to get more uh, young men and boys, um, men of any age singing. And I have, I have lived this because Carrie was my son's voice teacher oh. as well. One of the many ways I know <laughs> Carrie Wilkerson and his wife, Danielle Talamantes. And uh, my son went to graduate school in California and found himself incredibly lonely. And uh, I said, hey, I lead a choral music organization. I've heard it's really good if you look for a community chorus. And he took his skills that Carrie had uh, helped him develop over the course of, um, gosh, middle school and high school and joined a community chorus and has uh, really, really, it's been really valuable to him and he's made some great connections. So I'm, I, I'm a believer. Amy, I know you and I had chatted early on uh, a couple of months ago and we were talking about this whole concept of a uh, sort of a series for uh, the Virginia ACDA uh, TV R&R. You and I talked about separating the sexes and, and the value of that. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, there is a lot of research out there that, you know, dates back early to Cooksey doing research about um, changing voices and how, um, especially when those voices are changing, separating your trebles, your sopranos and altos, who will more than likely remain sopranos and altos from your trebles who will become tenors and basses or who are in that process can really allow you as an um, earlier educator to early age educator um, to really identify and help those students get through that vocal change and get through it effectively um, because the needs of our singers who um, 
our you know treble voices that remain treble voices are very different from those of our treble voices that turn into tenors and basses. Um, so there's you know there's and I just mentioned one name there in there, but there's a lot of research that supports that. Um, especially because those those treble voices that remain, their voice change ends up, you know, being very, very different in what um, what they can do, what um, the um, agility of their voice versus those tenors and basses while their voice is changing, how they lose, they lose their agility temporarily, but they have generally for a lot of them huge amounts of volume and um, the various ranges when you have a separate tenor bass, and I put that in quotes, because when you're talking like, you know, a sixth through eighth grade, grade choir, you call them oftentimes tenors and basses, but you have some altos in there and some sopranos as well. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, those um, tenor bass choirs, those early age tenor bass choirs can then sing in multiple ranges. They can do easy, earlier, sorry, easier literature, um, but they can sing in their comfortable range, which is the most important thing for them as their voice is changing, them feeling like they have somewhere to sing, because otherwise they say, I can't sing, I'm out. Um, but allowing them to have a space that they can sing, their voice is valued no matter what range it is, is really, really important. And Hillary, I don't know if you remember back in the day at UNC Greensboro when I was an undergraduate and studying with you, um, you introduced me to John Cooksey and his writings. That was something that uh, even back then I had an interest in, in changing voices and that's, uh, that's still a passion. Um, I, Catherine's son, Joe, started working with me when he was ninth or 10th grade, I think, and I think he could match five pitches. Uh, that's yeah. what we had to start with. And uh, so there, there was a journey that, that had to happen there and it was a lot of fun. And, and you know, Joe and I haven't been in touch with each other in a while, but we still, I think, are, are probably pretty close. Um, and, and I'm working with Amy's son, Daniel, right now, who's a ninth grader. Um, so, it, yeah, this is this is still something that's very uh, near and dear to me. Um, so, Hillary, I want to ask you the question from your perspective, and I know you have a, a, a very long perspective working with multiple age groups. Um, and also, you were you were running uh, the women's chorus at UNC Greensboro when right. I was there. And also, so Ohio was... State and University of Toronto, too. So I had travel choirs all the way through right right mm -hmm. what what is it to you uh, let me let me ask you a broader question what to you makes makes us want to sing what is it do you, that you think inspires us to sing well i think and this will support what Catherine said i think a lot of it is about community mm -hmm. um i've really become aware during the pandemic when I'm talking to teachers or sitting in on Zoom meetings with choirs, as I get to do sometimes, that they do miss the music, but what they really miss is that personal connection, um, being with each other, being in the music, um, in the moment, musically together, and hearing the results, what happens when they're on Zoom. If the teacher's listening individual, they can hear the improvement, but the singers can't. But when you're together, it's that feeling of, look what we've accomplished, isn't this wonderful? Um, I really think a lot of it is that. And where I, where I saw it very obviously was at the Ohio State University where the women's, it was called the Women's Glee Club. I would so change that name, but anyway, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, most of those singers were non-majors. There were always some music majors there, but I saw over the 17 years I was there young women who came out of that with their life's best friends, their future matrons of honor and bridesmaids at weddings. I mean, I still see stuff on Facebook where some of these people who sang in that group between 1993 and 2010 are still such close friends. And I think that's what they, you know, once in a while they say, oh, I remember when we went somewhere and we sang this great piece, but it's the friendship, it's the community that really counts with them. I see that in the church choirs I've led. They want to make good music, but they really want to be together. And I think that's something, you know, when you're in band, you have that space between you. You've got your instrument when you're in choir in the old days, and you could be next to your singing partner. You had that, um, that sense of personal, physical community, and you cannot duplicate that. So I think that's why people sing. 
I, yeah, I mean, you all know I made my career in choral singing, so it's uh, that's that's the biggest thing that I missed since I retired from the army. Is that um, I miss going into work every day and, and being with other people and having that shared experience. How how do we encourage men to sing? I'm just going to give a quick example because then <laughs> Catherine should speak. But one of my good friends here in Ohio is Bill Zerkey. And he had one of the best high school programs in Northern Ohio, in the whole state, everybody looked to him. He was the football coach. And as a result, he had the football team in the choir. But he always said to people, you need to recruit among the athletes. If you can get, you know, two or three of them to start and you forge a good relationship with the athletic team, he didn't have to worry about that because he was his own best friend. Um, get those singers in there and they're developing a part of their humanity that they might not just through sports and that brings so many people to the group and i remember he brought his choir to toronto there were a hundred of them and probably 60 were tenors and basses and they just sang their hearts out you could see it and yes a lot of them i said how many of you play football lots of people but I always thought it was an interesting approach um, and it might be worth a try. On the flip end, when you have coaches who regularly demean and degrade the arts, yes. it becomes very tricky. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I would never demean or de denigrate, mm -hmm. um, especially because I was a high, high school athlete, but I, I know it happens. I've, I've heard it happen. <laughs> I, you know, we've I've seen my students be, you know, affected by situations like that, which is just really unfortunate. That doesn't mean from all, but you know, it's it, it puts a big damper in a lot of the kids' lives um, because it creates this conflict that really is unnecessary. Um, but it, there doesn't need to be a separate existence, you know. Um, but the other thing that um, I find helps recruit um, young singers is encouraging your current singers to invite and and talk and be like, hey, why don't you sing? Those personal invitations peer to peer or older peer to younger peer in the neighborhood or something like that, those are, those are really important. Um, and I keep reminding my students that they, when they're singing, there is somebody looking up to them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some other younger child looking at them, seeing their future self in what they could potentially be doing. Um, so putting that, you know, good best effort forward and really showing with joy and respect for the arts mm -hmm. itself, those performances, uh, it makes a big difference. Um, and then the last thing I think that's huge is good literature. Because getting the right literature in your students' hands and out of your students' mouths at whatever level it might be. And I mean the right literature based on level, not like mm -hmm. good literature being the most advanced. You have to make sure that your singers are always singing that literature that lets them shine the most for wherever they're at in their time. And that will automatically, that excellence will automatically recruit for yourself and for, for the program so that the students have a full community. Uh, what I'm hearing certainly from the community choruses working with children and youth is a lot of this has to do with repertoire and being able to really walk the talk when it comes to inclusiveness, equity, diversity, all those things. And that plays out in repertoire. And uh, you can really attract kids and meet them where they are by thinking broadly about what they're going to sing and, uh, and what means something to them from where they're from in their community and where, where they're at in life, that kind of thing. The other thing that we're seeing is that's been very um, exciting, I guess, is that uh, the field, the choral field in general is moving towards being more inclusive, slowly but surely. And uh, we are seeing traditional men's groups call themselves tenor bass groups mm -hmm. or be more inclusive in their language uh, across the board with how they're talking about voice parts versus male, female. And that's been uh, another area where I think plays into recruitment in the broader sense of diversity as well. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's very important, I think. To, to think to think about that for your own group. I'm going to add too that that recruitment starts 
very young. We need to always, always invest in our youngest singers, those elementary age singers. Mm -hmm. And I think where we lose a lot of them is when they are, um, if their voices start changing when they're still in elementary school, those are the times where I hear um, some of them will have teachers that may say to them, well, just don't sing this part. Or, and that automatically makes the kid feel like, well, I can't sing, you know? And I, I said some, because obviously that's not all, but you know, that's when you hear some of those horror stories. And I remember graduating, not really knowing what to do um, with some of these voices that would change early, being like, gosh, I don't wanna tell them not to sing, but you know, getting those kids at a young age invested and um, singing stuff that works for them. Mm -hmm. The, the biggest takeaway from the Army Chorus Roundtable last November, for me personally, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I, a lot of those guys I've known for a long, long time, but we had never had this conversation about um, what led us all to, to this profession. And um, John Chi, who you know, had a very uh, long and uh, distinguished career, he was in the room and he said, well, you know, I, I just didn't know what else to do. And I, I, that's pretty much my story. I, I didn't know what else to do when I graduated high school. So I, I went to major music and, uh, and work on my voice. But the, the point is the Army Chorus, when we started talking about this at that round table, we all realized that we were all encouraged to sing at a very, very early age. Um, I, I remember the first time I ever performed in church, I couldn't have been more than four or five years old. Uh, and that was, you know, that was because my father was the pastor and and my siblings and I were, were the children's choir, you know. Um, but it, it is, it, it's very apparent to me that we need to start at a very early age encouraging young men to sing. And Jason Gottschall turned the question around on me and said, let's ask, why don't men sing? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you all that question. What is it that we're not doing that we need to do to, to get these young men at a very, very early age um, more active? Um, so I think, um, I think it's a larger societal issue at times. There's there, uh, and I think it's changing, but I feel like there was quite a long time where singing was kind of viewed and promoted as not being masculine enough. And I mean, I, I even saw it in a, a video that came out, like an instructional video that came out in our county a couple of years ago. And us choir directors were like, hey, this is not okay. And it got changed immediately. But I mean, the fact that people still think that that kind of rhetoric is okay tells you that the problem is still there. I do think it's better, but there there is a there is a disconnect in our overall society, which is always strange to me because if you look at some of our most famous pop singers, mm -hmm. like Bruno Mars, for example, I mean... Mm -hmm. He's a tenor slash alto, <laughs> if you were to really listen to his range. <laughs> and it, you know, he's, he's commanding that falsetto on, on a regular basis in an amazing way. And you know, that's how is that? I, I, I just don't understand the disconnect in our society in that respect, you know? I was thinking as we've been talking that some of this, some of the things we encourage around community choruses to widen their impact, and attract more participants it has to do with collaborations and where could you collaborate that might be some unusual, like non-music related other areas within a school, other areas within an elementary school. I, I completely agree about the earlier, the better. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, Seven, I think we found that like 70% of choral singers today started in elementary or middle school. So I can't overemphasize that enough as I know um, my colleagues would also agree. But it, I was thinking about ways to collaborate with other organizations within a school or showing up at different community events that people would find surprising to find choral singing even though words uh, the words of choral music and uh, the history often coincide beautifully with almost any subject matter, <laughs> any any place you can imagine, right? So yeah, but it 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 does come down to um, undoing some uh, social stigma kind of things as well. But mm -hmm. I apologize, I've got to jump off now. 
Thank you for including me and it was lovely being here. Thank with you for you jumping all. in. It's great to see you. All great right. Bye, Catherine. Bye bye. So Hillary, what about your perspective? What are, what are we not doing? I think there's sometimes an access issue. I've noticed that in the, well, sadly, the elementary programs seem to be diminishing. That was certainly the case in Ontario um, before I left in Toronto and it hasn't gotten any better. Um, just because music specialists are, they have to have two areas there and, and the music usually gets squeezed. So there's not automatic music for every kid in elementary school. And you know yourselves where it's mandated, the quality really varies. And I think if kids don't get a good start there, it's an issue. But I've also noticed there's a parallel growth of children's groups. But when you go watch children's choirs, so often there are very few males and lots more girls in those groups. And I also notice that sometimes it's an access issue because of money. What do we need to do to go into various communities to make this accessible? Can we take the choir to the school setting? Can we get permission to, to offer this event on the school site once a week or whatever it is so that kids don't have to worry about transportation? They don't have to worry about big fees. Um, I've always been concerned about that. And we scholarship some kids, but are we really accessing the kids who would love it? Are we going enough into the schools to find them? Anytime we expect them to come to us, I think we are asking for trouble in a way, particularly in inner city areas and so forth. Um, I think we have to do more than just teach them to sing too. I think it has to be maybe like a Sistema program where the kids are there, they're after school, they're getting a snack, they're getting help with homework, as well as the music. It's like the Delaware Choir School. It's how they operate. Um, I have a great nephew who's in the Sistema program in Canada playing violin. He loves it. It's his favorite time of the week because he's not only getting music, but he's getting some of these other things. Maybe we need to think more broadly than just about mm -hmm. come for an hour to children's choir and then your parents will pick you up. One thing I found a lot of teachers of a younger age who might not necessarily be instructed in vocal instruction. Right. Um, I know in Virginia, we started uh, a, rep a resource chair as an instrumental to vocal chair because we have a ton of teachers um, that are teaching chorus that don't know anything about voice. They've been instructed only in orchestra or band also very valid, valid forms of art. But, you know, if I were to go in front of a band right now, the poor band kids, um, they, you know, I, I'm not, I, I mean, I have a really good conducting pattern, but I'd be like, I, I don't know what you tune on, just have fun with that. So <laughs> I have to go check my book. Um, but we have a lot, a lot of people who are giving that instruction at early ages and they don't know what to do with like when they get that, you know, 11 year old kid whose voice changed and all of a sudden he's uh, an emerging bass, you know. Um, I think also um, we tend to have instructors for younger ages that are mostly female and have never had their voices change um, physically as a tenor to a tenor bass. I mean, we went through the voice change, but I know personally I didn't start singing until 10th grade, so I I don't know what it was like when my voice was changing and I was singing or change, you know. Um, but we have a lot of instructors that I think aren't fully instructed on what actually is happening. So they're doing their best, but you know, they might not have the skills. We have a lot that are, but you know, there's I think we need to inform and instruct a little bit more. Um, I think we need to instruct the general public as well about the connections of your brain activity and your mental health and music and the benefits of music. I don't feel like enough people recognize and realize that, you know, one of the reasons the Greek philosophers thought of music as a core subject was because of the positive health effects that it has on our bodies and the brain activity that happens while we're singing. My last comment, I promise it's my last one. Um, I think we as choral directors tend to promote, and I'm not saying it's bad, but we tend to promote only the perfection. And I think we need to embrace more the casual, wonderful experiences that we have in 
pick up choral singing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and those times where we're jamming together, it's not something you'd put on a, you know, elite performance stage, but most things aren't. Um, and we need to embrace those moments and celebrate them more. And I think that would make it more accessible to our general public as well. We sometimes create our own elitism. Right. And if we can avoid that and embrace those imperfections as well, still celebrate the perfection and the amazing performances. I'm not saying to take that away. I'm saying to add the other part more than we do. You know, I've been hearing that a lot from people during the pandemic, and I think it's so important about how we have to broaden our definition of excellence. And that it's not anymore the most important thing to get all the right rhythms and the right pitches. It's more important to understand what the text is, what the context of things is. We've had more time because there hasn't been the, the, the pressure of having to get a concert together so you can look at things in different ways. I'm not suggesting I'd be the last person to suggest that we abandon that kind of, of excellence, but there are other paths to excellence too. And you know, for that person who's singing in the beer choir, that is their definition of excellence they are singing and maybe they'll go hear one of their buddies who's in a community choir. And then you're kind of spreading it around. It's not just the park and bark kind of image that I think sometimes we have promoted and probably we have distanced some people as a result of that. You know, I'll, I'll never forget my first ACD conference. Uh, it was in 1992 in Chicago and um, I was there as a singing sergeant uh, to work the recruiting booth oh. in the uh, in the exhibits area, and uh, I I had never been to a conference before, so I didn't know what goes on. But that was a national conference. Maybe it wasn't. It must have been a divisional. Um, yeah, but I was I was yeah. yeah I was I was one of the geeks that went and sat in every single concert session and sat there for hours and hours and hours on end. I was just so taken by it all and. Um, you know, Hillary again, I don't know if you remember, I, I, I came to UNCG to, to become a choral director. That was my, that was my goal. Right. And my dream job was to get a, yep. uh, was to get a job as a high school choral director. And, um, I, you know, I sort of took a different path, but uh, I've always loved choral singing. And when I, I'll, I'll just never forget how much I appreciated the excellence in singing, um, um, that very first conference. Mm -hmm. I, I really, really admired and, and respected and appreciated that. And, and, you know, I've certainly sung with some outstanding choruses in my lifetime. That's, that's been a joy and a thrill. But I find myself at this stage in life, what we're talking about right now, uh, really wanting to reach out to the people who are, are not excellent singers. Mm -hmm. um, wanting to reach out to those people who, who really need individual attention and, and need encouragement and help. Uh, and, you know, I, Daniel and I both are working with singers right now privately that, uh, that just love it so much they can't stop doing it. Um, but, you know, they don't, they don't have the skill set. So we, we're working with them privately to help them attain the skill set to enjoy it, uh, a fuller, richer experience in their, in their choral singing and their solo singing. How do we find those people? How do we find the people out there who, who really, really want to sing? that might not have the skill set or the background and that, that might not be the excellent singer in our chorus. Um, how do we reach out to them? I think uh, creating that sense of community that is attractive because people, you know, we started the conversation talking about how important community is to our singers and how it, oftentimes we've now you know, really been made aware that that is possibly the most important thing. Um, I pulled my students last week asking them what they were excited about. Um, we've been virtual all year and what are you most excited about for when you get here? And I can't tell you how many of them, the overwhelming majority said singing with my friends, being with my friends, singing harmonies with my friends. Everything had to do with the act of that relationship with the people in there. And I think we need to make that relationship enticing and also inclusive um, and really, really, you know, get that ball rolling or continue it rolling of inviting people um, and having our singers invite people and starting at a really a, a young age. 
Um, also remembering that it's never too late to start. I mean, I was a transfer over. I didn't start until I was what, 15 or 16. And in singing land, that can be kind of late, you know. Um, and it's still, it's never too late. That's the great thing about singing. It's never too late to start. <laughs> uh, but finding a way to make that community visible so that others want to be part of it and inviting them. <laughs> and maybe sometimes assigning something besides a musical reason for being there that that group is going to exist for a short period of time to do something um something in the community or just like we do you know in a church choir I always used to have like a six week window where they could come and join us for Christmas or before Easter and we would often get people who would stay because they came in thinking it was a short term I'll just see how I like this um, I don't have to commit to the whole year and then they'd get hooked so in that case it was more about the time and and kind of um you know an important religious holiday if you will or significant um celebration for them but i can envision in the community that you're putting a group together um maybe you're going to raise funds for a homeless shelter or something like that and you get the people there and you begin singing with them and maybe you're singing unison stuff who knows maybe you're looking into the social justice book that uh song book that that's been put together and you use things from there but you, you help them understand how singing can be a vehicle for other things, and then it becomes its own reward. Um, you know, I think we used to approach it from the other end. I remember teaching music education classes that the important reason for being in music was the aesthetic reason. And then I had a daughter who was taking dance, and I didn't know anything about dance. But I could see how she was developing poise and confidence and I started sort of valuing the non dance things and it gave I thought oh that's what these other parents are doing about music and I'm always criticizing them. Because they're talking about oh it's good discipline is this, but I began to see that all those things are important and I think sometimes we have to go at it from the end that we were not taught in university and we can eventually. Um, engage people in all parts of that experience. Are there any any final thoughts that either of you have? Um, one was just an idea um, you, uh, that went related to the last question. Um, and I've only done this once and I'm definitely going to be doing it more, I think in the future, is um, programming a song that involves some audience participation. Mm -hmm. That, you know, maybe you're, maybe the, the director or the singers on stage are teaching the audience. I know I've seen some other people do it as well, but maybe that's a little bit more important than I've thought it to be in the past. If we're really wanting singing to be something that's for everyone, then shouldn't we make it for everyone in our concerts, even in a little yeah. of time? <laughs> so. Well, I love that because it breaks down the formality in a way. You're not sitting there passively watching, but you're engaging. Um, one of my friends here in town has a parent choir that she puts together. And, uh, you know, they meet once a week again for a short period of time. So they do something together at the end of the year. And she gets really good turnout. Parents oh, are singing with their cute. kids and yeah. So those kinds of experiences, I think, are really positive ways of engaging people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time. I really appreciate this.